Good morning, Annie, Kweke, Wache, bonjour tout le monde. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and further recognize that Laurentian University is located on the traditional lands of the Tikmashing and Ishinabek, and that the greater city of Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Awanapate First Nation. Je m'appelle Tammy Eager, la vice-rectrice à la recherche à l'Université Laurentienne et la maîtrise de cérémonie aujourd'hui. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has prevented us from physically gathering with a large group of faculty, students, and community of partners, this event is being streamed online so others can join virtually to help us celebrate today. Welcome to all that have joined online and persons speaking today, including Paul Lefebvre, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources, Mark Sare, a Member of Parliament for Nickel Belt, Dr. Robert Haché, President of Laurentian University, Dr. David Pearson, Professor, School of the Environment at Laurentian University, Genevieve Kajik, Grand Council Treaty 3, Sarah Cockerton, Manager of the Four Rivers Environmental Service for the Matawa, Matawa First Nations in Thunder Bay, and delegates from Natural Resources Canada. At l'Université Laurentienne, nous nous entendons sur les valeurs communes, le Nord nous inspire, la curiosité est le maître de nos recherches et la rachant sont notre priorité. Today's funding announcement has come about due to these shared values, inspired by the North, driven by research curiosity, and only possible because of relationships. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Sudbury MP Paul Lefebvre, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources, the Honourable Seamus O'Regan, to deliver remarks. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Tammy. It's a great pleasure to uh, see you virtually. Uh, that's our, our lives right now, but uh, it's great that we're able to get together and do this. Donc, bonjour et bon après-midi tout le monde. Ani, quoi, quoi. Um, I also want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of the Atikmishing and Anishinaabek, and that the greater city of Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nation. Um, it's wonderful to be here at, with Laurentian and be joined by my colleague Marc Serret, a member of uh, Parliament for Nickel Belt. Marc, c'est toujours un plaisir de travailler avec toi dans tous nos travaux qu'on fait ensemble et, et, et nos projets. Également, Robert Haché, président de la Laurentienne. Robert, un plaisir de te revoir encore. Um, we have a lot of important guests here today, and I really am very, very pleased. I know this is a project is a long time coming, and I really want to acknowledge before I, uh, I start David Pearson, who's with us. Uh, very uh, happy that uh, we're able to make this announcement, and I want to really personally thank you before I go on with the official remarks by, by the department. But I, I know the work that you've been doing for decades now, and it's uh, we are honored to have you in Northern Ontario and in Sudbury, and it's an honor always a time to be in your presence. And I really want to recognize the amazing work that, that you're doing now and you've done over the past decades. So it, again, it's a real honor for me to be doing this with you. So it's great to be home. I am not in Ottawa, as you can see from my background, I'm home. <laughs> and so, and it's great to be here in Sudbury and to be able to share with you our government's vision to drive Canada's post COVID recovery by building a stronger, more inclusive and sustainable economy, which we come when we come on the other side. But to do that, we have to address the greatest challenge of our time, climate change. Specifically, how we respond to the rapid changes it is bringing to our environment. Pour y arriver, nous devons relever le plus grand défi de notre époque, le réchauffement climatique. Plus particulièrement, nous devons trouver des moyens de faire face aux changements rapides que ce phénomène provoque dans notre environnement. For millennia, indigenous peoples have adapted to changes in the lands and waters. Today, those changes are coming with increasing speed and severity, bringing unprecedented changes to the environment. It's time to come together to share knowledge and experiences, to better prepare ourselves for the changes we're facing together. That's what today is all about. So I am pleased to announce that our government is investing $841,000 to build Indigenous capacity to adapt to climate change. So this project, is being co-led by Laurentian University, the Grand Council Treaty 3, and the Tribal Councils of Moshkegawuk, Matawa, Nokiwin, Shibugama, and the Kiwatinuk Okimakanak uh, groups. So each tribal council has recruited a climate specialist that will braid indigenous knowledge with Western science, bringing together findings and perspectives to create a resilient future. I can't 
think of, of a better approach of how we move forward. This project is an important step in adapting to the realities of a changing climate. In fact, the traditional lands covered by the partner tribal councils represents about 40% of Ontario from the Manitoba border to James Bay and north from Lake Superior to Hudson's Bay. So the impacts could be enormous. It will, be, it will enable Indigenous communities to deal with the impacts of a warming environment today while better preparing for the future. And the knowledge gained here in Northern Ontario can be shared with First Nations communities across the country. So congratulations to all of you on this important initiative. Les connaissances acquises ici dans le nord de l'Ontario peuvent être partagées avec les communautés de Premières Nations partout au pays. Alors toutes mes félicitations à chacun d'entre vous pour cette, cette importante initiative. It is a clear statement that together we can tackle climate change head on, that we can adapt, build resilience and create a better future for the generations to come. So I wish you every success. Miigwech. Donc avec ça, je passe la parole à mon collègue Marc Serry. Marc, à toi la parole. Merci, Paul. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, pour les commentaires. Puis merci pour uh, ton leadership uh, avec un ARCAN comme assistant parlementaire uh, au ministre. Um, thank you so much for all you've done um, with natural resources, but obviously adding this component here of climate change. Um, and it's, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the two MPs in Greater Sudbury, we try to make a difference for the community. Uh, I just want to echo uh, what Paul indicated, obviously, the leadership of uh, Laurentian University all across Northern Ontario, but especially uh, a big thank you to President Abadashe and your team, um, David Pearson and, and everyone else that has taken um, the, not an approach of, of uh, collaboration, but really an approach of partnership with our First Nations, um, hand in hand and, and, and taking the advice. So it's great to have online from all over on, uh, Northern Ontario with Thunder Bay, the Grand Council and, and the Treaty 3 uh, uh, chiefs uh, available. Because uh, when we look at climate change, um, as put indicated, our Indigenous communities, when you look at land, water, air, fire, there is no better there is no better group. There is no better peoples that understand what to do with the effects of climate change. So we've attended many uh, student uh, Fridays for Strike for Students for the Environment here in Greater Sudbury. Um, indigenous um, is, is embedded in the discussion every Friday when we look at uh, on drip, what we need to do there also. Um, but I just wanna thank uh, the leadership of, of Laurentian and, and that we know that uh, Greater Sudbury's story as Paul indicated uh, many times in his travel, the 40 years of regreening, the 40 years of, uh, of working closely with our indigenous partners is, is, is really great. So, merci de m'avoir invité aujourd'hui, puis merci aussi de continuer à nous pousser um, au niveau de l'environnement, de nous pousser à continuer à s'assurer que nos peuples autochtones de Première Nation sont impliqués et, et qui prennent charge uh, du leadership à, à ce niveau ici. So, thank you so much. Let's keep up the good work because we got a lot to do for climate change and it is good for economy, it's good for the recovery, and we will make it happen together. Merci. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you so much, so much uh, MP Lefebvre and MP Sare, for your inspiring words and certainly for the investment of 841,000 to support the partnership between Laurentian University and six tribal councils to build climate change adaptation capacity. Uh, uh, the, the North will uh, be inspired and your, this contribution will make an incredible difference. So really, truly thank you for that investment. Uh, je voudrais maintenant souhaiter la bienvenue au recteur et vice-chancellor Robert Taché pour dire quelques mots. Uh, merci, uh, Dr. Rager. Uh, Annie, Wache, Kwekwe, bonjour, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. I too want to acknowledge the territory of the Atikamekshing on Schnabek and the Robinson Huron Treaty, as well as the Wanapite First Nation. Greater Sudbury is very fortunate to share this land with these strong Anishinaabek nations. And it is very important never to lose sight of this. At Laurentian, our researchers, faculty members, students, postdoctoral fellows and staff are involved in a number of projects that truly speak to part of our core mandate. Our comprehensive approach to Indigenous education would not be possible 
without outstanding projects such as the one being launched and recognized today. Such projects transcend boundaries, bringing together communities, nations, and researchers from all over the North in an effort to mutually build capacity. Je suis très fier de nos professeurs et de nos étudiants qui se concentrent à bien changer notre monde en effort de réduction du changement climatique. De plus, à la langue ancienne, les relations sont nos priorités et les nombreux projets qui rassemblent des experts autour du monde et des, coins de notre, des recoins de notre région sont incroyables. We continue to be at a pivotal moment with respect to climate change. Our society is in need of guidance and education from a multitude of world, world views. I want to thank Dr. Pearson for his continued commitment to working with Indigenous nations in the North. Dr. Pearson's work over his illustrious career has embodied the principles of respect, reciprocity, and humility for which I acknowledge and thank him on behalf of the entire Laurentian community. I also would like to extend thanks to the tribal councils joining us today as partners in this research project. These tribal councils are representing a vast number of Anishinaabe Aski nations and Anishinaabe nation community. These, this project will see critically important exchanges of knowledge in efforts to co-educate each other on best approaches to navigating changing ecosystems climates, and weather patterns due to climate change. I also want to thank Minister O'Regan being represented today by the MP for Sudbury, Mr. Paul Lefebvre, our Parliamentary Secretary for Natural Resources. I also want to thank both Paul and our MP for Nickel Belt, Mark Sade, as well. Your commitments to the North and the important investments in the North that are needed today more than ever are incredibly appreciated. Laurentian University is continually grateful for the ongoing collaboration with the federal government and our local MPs, Paul and Mark. Congratulations, félicitations à tout le monde. Thank you, Rob, so much for highlighting the importance of this investment and, and the important contributions of research at Laurentian and the importance of partnership and true collaboration with Indigenous communities throughout the North. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Pearson, professor in the School of Environment at Laurentian University and co-director of the Building Climate Change Adaptation Capacity Project, who will now say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Tammy. And um, thanks so much to you, Paul uh, Lefebvre and, and Mark uh, Saray, if I may call you Paul and Mark. My goodness, we've known each other for so many years. Thanks so much for those very kind uh, words, Paul. You're too generous, but um, I owe you a couple of beers for those <laughs> when we get, get a chance to, to get together again. Um, so, but let me thank you formally for the um, for the support of the work from of this work from NRCAN and from the uh, from the federal government. Um, I, as you've already noted, the work has been ongoing for quite a little while. But uh, as I also mentioned casually before this, um, this uh, meeting formally began, we, we do have some other ideas that we want to be running by um, your Enercan staff that we think will continue this work uh, and, and make it actually uh, nationally, uh, nationally useful, nationally appropriate. Um, I, I, I do want to emphasize what's already been said, and that is that this is very much a, a team project, very much a team project. The, um, the application to Anacan for funding uh, was um, not just supported, but in fact, the signatures of the, um, the Grand Council Treaty 3 representative and then the representatives of the other uh, tribal councils were on that application. This has been teamwork right from the, from the start. It was conceived as teamwork and it's been carried out as, uh, uh, as, um, as, as teamwork. The, um, the proposal included very deliberately uh, a position in each of the, the councils, each of the, the regional councils. And you'll hear from um, Geneva Kejic, uh, I, I hope in a moment, um, although she's in another time zone and I'm a little worried that maybe she, <laughs> she's not caught the, right, um, caught the right time zone. But you'll hear from Geneva, I believe. And Geneva is one of those climate change specialists. There are others in each of the tribal councils and I wish we'd had time to let them speak as um, speak as well. And uh, Geneva, in fact, having been a part-time climate change specialist at the beginning of this project has recently in, in May, 
um, been uh, uh, raised to a full-time climate change specialist for Grand Council Treaty 3. Uh, also, uh, I, I think that that's uh, uh, in part a, a consequence of the awareness of the importance of um, uh, supporting a person in, in a, a tribal council, in, a, in their case, a, a Grand Council Treaty 3, that is dedicated to, uh, to the climate change uh, issues. Uh, and I'll introduce Geneva later and tell you a little bit more about, uh, about her, her background. Uh, a very key tool in the conduct of this project and then the way that we designed it that has in fact become very much uh, uh, more valuable in the light of, of COVID and the fact that we can't hold in-person meetings. I can't go to Thunder Bay and meet with uh, tribal councils. I can't go up to, um, to Fort Seven or in the Timmins for a, a meeting of the uh, Meshkagawak uh, Council. And, and they can't come to Sudbury for, um, for meetings and, and, and workshop sessions either. And, and that is the, uh, the Facebook group, the Acclimat Now um, tool, the communication tool that um, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, acknowledge that Chantal Sarazandile on our team and Kim Fram uh, put, to, put together um, for, the, uh, for the project. It's, it's a, a learning Facebook group. We post and, and the participants in the, the Facebook group from their tribal councils and from, in, in some cases, individual communities also post. We post what I suppose people would call uh, educational stuff. Uh, we post um, plain language summaries of important aspects of, of climate change, uh, important themes, and, and then the, uh, the, local, the local people post uh, the observations and the, the knowledge that, um, that they have uh, of, uh, of the changes that have been seen and the changes that are being, being seen. So, for example, when there's an, an, an ice uh, uh, build up in the river at Bearskin Lake, then th there uh, are uh, observations of how that's happening and photos that are posted on the Facebook page. So it's a communication tool, an active communication tool that uh, connects communities and connects the tribal councils right across the north. And it's a big area, as Paul pointed out. It's, it's not much smaller if you're used to looking at um, European maps. It's not much smaller than Spain. It's a huge area. Uh, with over 60 First Nation communities in it, and all of them potentially engaged through the um, through the, the Facebook group, we we still have more work to do to 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 enlarge on that engagement. But it's turned out to be a very valuable tool, along with Zoom, which has been a blessing as well. We have weekly Zoom meetings with all of the climate change specialists, and with the co-leads who are on a a. Um, a coordinating panel for the project. So this is not um, not just a, uh, by a long chalk, not just a, a Laurentian uh, an initiative. It's a, a, a shared and, and, and a team initiative. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the the teamwork began before even those of uh, of you who are part of the um, the uh, the brace support today. It began in 2016-18 with support from the province, with quite considerable support from the province, which allowed us to visit communities and to, um, to engage people in communities to gather traditional knowledge. And by having that traditional knowledge and splicing together the knowledge from Western science, which has to do largely with the, um, with the projections of future climate change, we were able to write 24 reports for those communities, confidential reports. This was not research that we ran off and then put into journals. These were confidential reports written for the, to improve the well-being of people in communities, to improve their understanding of the, uh, the projections of the knowledge of elders into the, the future, which Western science is able to, to offer. And those reports are now in the, the hands of the climate change specialists and the tribal councils, the communities having released them to the, uh, to the climate change specialists. Uh, and they are now part of the, uh, the process of building the capacity in communities. We are continuing to, to contribute. And I just got an email this morning from uh, one of our team, Kim Fram, telling me that the, the draft, uh, the latest draft of the adaptation planning guide for use by communities, which will also go into the hands of 
the uh, the climate change specialists that that is uh, that is now ready. So the the teamwork is uh, is continuing. And what we had hoped and what would have happened if it hadn't been for COVID is that uh, uh, I and, and members of our, our team would have gone out into communities with the climate change specialists to, if you like, guide them in the use of the, uh, the guidebook and the processes for engaging communities in discussion uh, with, um, with uh, climate change adaptation in mind. What are we going to, uh, what are we going to do about the impacts that we've, um, that we've, that we've seen? Um, I, I do want to emphasize that the communities of the North are very much on the cutting edge of um, the leading edge of the impacts of, uh, of climate change. Winters are warming. There are now more rain days in, in winter than there used to be. Elders will tell you that, and you can find it by looking at the, uh, the, the uh, weather records, which are few and far between in the North, an area as big as Spain with four weather stations. But that's what uh, that's what history has uh, has, has has given us. Um, the winter road season is slowly becoming shorter. Uh, there are drier summers, and the increase in vulnerability of communities to wildfires has uh, already led to um, to much work with the Ministry of Natural Resources and their Fire Smart program. Um, geese are flying over. And, and communities, some communities at least, have invited members of other communities where the geese are not as accessible as they used to be to come to their community where they still are accessible. So that's, a, if you like, a very communal, a very uh, broad thinking way of, um, of enabling uh, people to work in communities to, to adapt. And there have also been notices of, uh, from elders that berries are not as easy to find. So we need to talk about ways that, that that blueberry patches uh, can be uh, can be can be cultivated. There's a lot of work still to be done, as I mentioned at the beginning of this. We uh, we're not only speaking with uh, with NRCAN about the development of um, an interactive data storage uh, and um, data uh, an information hub, an active information hub. We're talking about that with um, with Bob Duffin, who's on this call here in Muskegawak. And um, we've also begun to talk about it with um, with uh, Sarah in, uh, in in Matawa, and we think there's um, there's a great opportunity for for another step in this um, this um, this brace um, this brace brace project. And and also, and this is not to do with um, with so much with adaptation, although there is there are co benefits. We're also talking with ISO about um, putting a climate change lens on the. Um, the energy initiatives, the, the the renewable energy projects, which are being funded by the independent uh, electricity systems operator in uh, in Ontario, there isn't a climate change lens at the moment, uh, and we think that quantifying the uh, contribution of First Nations in the north to the reduction of greenhouse gases in Canada, as part of going towards Canada's uh, new carbon neutral by 2050, is is a, a part of. Um, uh, and a, a logical extension of the kind of work that we're doing. There are adaptation benefits in, in, in improving the energy resilience of communities. Without energy resilience, you can't focus on adaptations. And so we regard that as, uh, as in fact, a co-benefit for, uh, for adaptation and we're pursuing, pursuing that as an option. So that's um, that's our view of where we are and how we're making progress, and and I'd like very much to be able to introduce Geneva, but uh, I don't see her name there, so I'm going to hand it back to you, Tammy, and hope that uh, you can tell me that Geneva is. Uh, I am online. here, David. Ah, there you are. Should I just roll, Tammy, and introduce Geneva? Uh, yes, Geneva please. is the, uh, the, the now full-time climate change specialist since May, as I mentioned, in, uh, for Grand Council Treaty 3 in Kenora. Geneva has um, been very uh, active in engaging young people in considering the impacts of climate change and uh, how they can play, play a role. Uh, she has uh, organized youth summits for several years, and I've had the pleasure of attending several of them. And, and she also recently has begun to work with teachers in classrooms and taking understanding of climate change into the, um, the, uh, the classrooms of, of young people who in 2050 
will be the recipients of the kind of climate that we have created because the climate of 2050 is already already determined by the greenhouse gases we've already released there's nothing we can do about 2050 what we can do something about is 2080 in the end of the, the end of the century so uh, geneva's work is very very relevant um, with uh, with regard to young people as as well as uh, to um to the uh, to the importance of of her understanding of the impacts on other uh, on on communities in Grand Council Treaty Three. Sorry, Geneva, that's a bit of a long introduction, but I want people to know how good you are at uh, working with uh, with young people. So, Geneva, I think I can hand the mic to you now. Thank you, David. Hi, so my name is Geneva Kijik, and I'm a First Nations woman from Grassy Narrows, Ontario, which is about ninety. KMs north of Lawn Kenora. Um, I started at Grand Council Treaty 3 in 2017 and I was originally hired as the climate education coordinator. And I returned to Grand Council in August, which I started the BRACE project with Laurentian University as part time climate specialist and then part time climate education coordinator. Uh, recently, I was offered the climate specialist position full time because our organization gained some funds to keep me full time just as climate specialist. Well, we hired some another full person to take over the climate education program, which I would like to thank Laurentian University because they support us in providing a letter of support and gaining funding with climate change health and adaptation program which funded our Teaching Our Keepers climate education program. Um, Laurentian University has also been very supportive in investing in our youth's education around climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, they've, we've hosted a youth climate summit every year in Kenora, Ontario, where over 100 youth attend from all over Treaty 3. Our nation comprises of um, 28 First Nations, so we get about 100. And I don't think Laurentian University has ever missed a summit. They're there every year contributing to our speaker panel. And yeah, we look forward to seeing them every year and the kids look forward to listening too. And they've, they're they also they're also part of helping us, helping our youth also develop our climate youth strategy development teams. So we had, we launched the project this year where we have youth in three of our First Nations do a draft strategy and the complete strategy. And then we're gonna expand that to the other 28 First Nations very soon. So it was very great that David was able to join these youth teams for dinner doing during our 2019 Youth Climate Summit. So he was able to listen to the youth on their plans for adaptation and mitigation in their First Nations and as well suggest some ideas. But I think he was very pleased with what they had so far. Um, for me as a First Nations person, I think it was very, it was very moving that I um, was able to be part of the, this very private meeting um, during the Vancouver Adaptation 2020, which I also got to attend with Laurentian for my professional development. So it was part, is a special, occasion for me to be part of the NRCAN BRACE networking meeting because it was very small, very limited seating. So it was like, it was good to, it was like a knowledge sharing network. Um, the other people's in attendance it was most more like we we're trading information. I was interested in the Western science part and they were looking to me for that traditional knowledge perspective, that First Nations knowledge perspective. <laughs> Laurentian also helped us move our community-based monitoring program forward. Chris Herc is the coordinator for that, so he'd probably have a little bit more to say on that, but they are very generous and they provided our coordinator with some training and offered it to our First Nations as well. And they've also donated a YSI tester to our program, which we use in communities and hopefully our our other First Nations will have their own. We got three other communities, their own YSI testers, and then we have little miniature kits that they could use as well for now until they move their programs forward. And I'm, hold on. 
Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Geneva. Um, boy, there's a, a, a lot of your time and a lot of your effort gone into all that you described there. And um, I know that you have a young family to look after as well. So uh, thank you very much for all that you've contributed to the, to the, um, to the sharing of knowledge with the uh, other uh, climate change specialists that you, you spoke about um, at, in fact, one of our weekly meetings uh, just, uh, just two or three weeks ago. So thanks so much. I'd, I'd like now, if I could, to, to introduce uh, Sarah Cockerton. Sarah Cockerton is in the, um, in the staff list for, um, for the Matawa Tribal Council as the, the manager of Four Rivers uh, Environmental Services Group. Sarah is more than a manager. Sarah is a leader. And Sarah's been with the uh, Environmental Manager Group, manage, Management Group, for, um, for 11 years now, I think it is, certainly more than 10 since I first, uh, first met her. And um, it's it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, introduce Sarah to speak um, uh, on behalf of the co-leads because Sarah is a co-lead in this uh, project. Uh, she comes to the attends the um, the coordinating panel meetings as as well as quite frequently attending the um, the meetings for the climate change specialist and the discussions and the presentations. So, Sarah, it's a, a pleasure to to introduce you and ask you to to take the mic. Thank you very much, David, and uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, very pleased to um, have been invited and uh, hopefully my uh, connection, which is quite poor, will, will hold up while I, I say a few things uh, with, with you all today. Uh, Four Rivers is the environmental arm of Matawa First Nations management and uh, Metala supports the nine Metala member communities in Northern Ontario. And we specifically have been supporting our communities at Forvers over the last decade in things like uh, environmental stewardship, environmental monitoring, environmental research. Um, in, in response of a, a lot of issues we see coming, um, but, but in, in the spirit of capacity building um, so that our, our communities um, can, can participate and be involved in the planning going forward. Our communities reside in a largely uh, undeveloped uh, and pristine area of uh, north and northeast uh, of Thunder Bay. Their traditional homelands and territories and associated watersheds um, represent an area of over 330,000 square kilometers. Uh, extending almost all the way to the northern border of Ontario. Our communities also surround an area that has become known as the Ring of Fire, an intensely mineral rich region that is speculated to contain uh, deposits on the scale of those found uh, there in Sudbury. Five of our communities are remote, uh, accessed by air, and if weather cooperates, by winter road. Our community's language, culture, health, well-being, and long-term sustainability is directly linked uh, to the land. Uh, they carry out traditional practices, relying it on, on it for subsistence. Our, our community members are immediately and directly impacted by changes into the environment in a way that few of us living in urban centers can understand or even appreciate. This deep-seated connection to the land, the dependency on it for subsistence, and the reliance on cooperative conditions um, for, for access to necessary services or resources make our communities highly vulnerable to climate change. First Nation communities have and are already experiencing the impacts of a changing climate including thinning ice, impacts to winter roads, and have seen or anticipate uh, additional impacts uh, like changing species ranges, increased frequency of forest fires, spread of disease or pestilence, um, and of course, just an overall unpredictability. In 2018-19, Matawa First Nations Management embarked on a climate change assessment project 
aiming to understand and document how climate change was specifically impacting each of our communities from the perspective of that community. This large undertaking includes documentation of community observations, traditional knowledge, um, but it also community priorities and values. The culmination of these efforts, which will extend into 2022, uh, will result in vulnerability assessments, which will form uh, a basis for adaptation planning. As our efforts um, entirely focus on our community's perspectives, the comprehensiveness of the assessments will rely on linking to other technical knowledge, as well as a network of other resources, so that ultimately our communities can make informed decisions. Um, with our efforts being so focused on our communities themselves, de developing and maintaining these technical knowledge and resource linkages is, is beyond our effective ability. Uh, and this is where this brace, the BRACE project that we're speaking of today really fits in for us. We all need to have the opportunity to do our, our respective work at our appropriate levels. Climate change adaptation efforts and associated resources uh, do need to be supported at the community, the regional or tribal council and provincial and sub-regional levels. Um, because groups at each of those levels are uniquely suited to add a different critical element or perspective that will bring about more effective solutions. The work our communities are doing or planning on doing is absolutely critical, as is the work we are doing at the regional or tribal council level. But even with those uh, collective efforts, there's still a gap. And um, by connecting regional groups, tribal councils, and communities to each other, um, and connecting them to knowledge and resources, the BRACE pulp project fills some of those gaps. The challenges associated with climate change are bigger than any one of us. The challenges are, are bigger than even any single group of us. Uh, coming up with solutions that might have a chance of supporting effective adaptation requires all of us to work together. We each need to bring our own special knowledge or skills to the table. We each need to do what we do best and we each need to share what we know best. BRACE establishes the uh, collaborative network where we can come together and share and then go out and do. We are very proud to be part of this initiative and look forward to the collective benefit we will all realize through it. We hope to see many more initiatives like this in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miigwech, Dr. Pearson and Genevieve Kajic and Sarah Cockerton for telling us about the incredible work that you are all leading uh, in, in the collaboration within community. Through investment from Natural Resources Canada, this collaborative partnership between Laurentian University and the six tribal councils illustrates what can happen when research addresses a societal need and people come together on Psalm Mamwi. Thank you to everyone who has joined us online today to celebrate this important funding announcement from Natural Resources Canada. And particularly thank you to MP Lefebvre and MP Saray for your continued efforts to champion Laurentian University and the North. Uh, we now have time for a few questions and we'll give an opportunity for the uh, media that are attending today to indicate in the chat box if they would like to ask a question of any one of our speakers. Perhaps while I'm waiting for that to happen, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a few people from Laurentian University who have made this event possible with uh, organization, Joseph Burke, Giselle Roberts, and Jonathan Minu. So thank you so much for the work that you've done in partnership with NRCAN to help uh, bring this uh, event virtual today. I see that there's a question from Sarah McMillan. So Sarah, over to you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for the uh, government officials who are here. Um, I understand that this work has been going on for some time. And I, my first question is just about uh, why this announcement is being made now. Uh, and also, uh, given that it has been going on for a little while now, if we can expect to see uh, further funding to continue uh, with this project beyond uh, the current term, seeing as it's already well underway. Thank you for that question. I think we want to make this announcement actually in the spring, so it's been a, it's been a while now that we've been with COVID and uh, imagine as well as there was an election last year, so timing is never uh, um, never perfect, but we thought that it was very important that we make this announcement that we make it public. That is just not you know researchers coming together and making this great work. The public needs to know know what's going on, and so the fact that it's yes we're obviously in this. Uh, in this project, as, as it's ongoing, it's, it's, it's important that we uh, highlight it. And you're on your second question, uh, whether it does the funding will continue well, there's applications and there's processes that uh, that, that, that need to happen. I know Dr. Pearson is in touch only with the department as, to, as, as we move forward. Certainly this is a priority for us. Climate change is a priority for, for our government and, and at, at NRCAN, certainly we are at the forefront and we, are, we have the rural lens Certainly, when it comes to climate change and uh, and the areas uh, and with uh, with respect, certainly with respect to, to First Nations and the and the expertise that they bring to the table that has never gone um, before that was not asked to the level that it is uh, now. We must go down. We must continue down down this path. And certainly, uh, I will be more than happy to continue championing uh, these types of, of of initiatives that we can continue to support. Thank you. And also, if I just want to add to what Pudge just said, uh, Sarah, is is the media often covers a lot of what's wrong in certain areas. And, and this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. This is why we wanted to keep this announcement alive, keep this announcement to inform the community, to ensure that the media has an opportunity to tell all the good work that's being done by the First Nations on the environment. There's a lot of good work being done and we want to make sure, and yes, COVID and everything else has delayed the announcement, but we wanted to make sure that uh, you get an opportunity to share the good news and the talented and the, the work uh, that we have like the Sarah's here and, and, and all of that that are doing the great work in the First Nations all over Northern Ontario. Thank you so much for those remarks. And I, I see we have a question for Genevieve. Uh, can you talk about the climate change challenges in the Treaty 3 area and the views uh, of young people? Uh, the, this, the question says, you know, we often hear from elders, which are absolutely important, but could you tell us a little bit about the, the views from young people? Hello. So, what we've heard in our draft strategies from our youth is that there's a lot of flooding in their First Nations. Um, two of our First Nations in the Kenora area had to be evacuated due to flooding. So they declared um, climate, climate, climate crises. And so the youth are very aware of the fluctuating water levels. One of the youth in our groups has made an observation. He's concerned that his house is too close to the water and it, it floods their driveway all the time. So he notices that. And then there's firefighters as well becoming closer into our community. So that's something the youth brought up. And they've come up with plans for adaptation, which would be fire smart training. And a big concern from our youth is the extended power outages. So they live in these communities and every winter um, they've had a power outage of like two to three days. And that's these modern, these homes are becoming more modern. So if a home doesn't have a wood stove, then they go without heat or their food goes bad. So these are all um, concerns that the youth have voiced because they've lived through it. Um, the local municipalities don't have enough resources. The Kenora has been exhausted of rooms during a week long power outages where over 12 of our First Nations have had to be evacuated. And then some were stuck in First Nations with no hydro, um, no where to cook food. 
cold homes, even those even include people with babies. So their focus would be on finding other ways so that people don't have to be evacuated. We recently secured funding to help them with that. So we provided them with um, generators to serve up a, as a backup source during these power outages. And then also flash flooding. The youth brought up that rain, rain events are becoming higher. So like this past year, we got 150 millimeters in one day, which created road washouts. Culverts weren't big enough to handle all that water flow. So roads caved in. And this is mostly what we've heard from our youth so far as focusing on mitigating these disasters in their communities. Thank you for telling us about uh, the experiences of the youth. It's so important uh, uh, that the youth are engaged and, and working closely with, uh, with the elders and to hear about the, the collaboration between Indigenous ways of knowing and, and Western science. Uh, one final question uh, for Dr. Pearson. Uh, there, there were, one of the reporters asked if, if some of the reports are available to the public. So perhaps you could provide a comment on, on how people could reach you and, and others to, uh, to get a copy of some of the information that's publicly available. We actually put together what we call a fictional report, which is not applicable to any specific community. So there's no community knowledge being uh, being spread beyond uh, those who, who own that knowledge in the in the community, uh, and I'm very pleased. I'll be very pleased to send that. Uh, send me an email, dpearson at laurentian.ca, and we can follow up. Thank you so much to all the speakers today, and thank you again to MPP Lefebvre and MPP uh, Surrey. Thank you to the incredible leadership of of all the youth uh, involved in in this work, this incredible work to all of the indigenous communities, the First Nations partners, and to uh, researchers that are collaborating with your team as well, Dr. Pearson. This concludes our event today. Merci beaucoup d'entrevenu. Have a good day, everyone. Merci.